Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the Delsby Dell. And it's episode 149. Oh, those 40s whizzed by. Whizzed by. Whizzed by. They yes, did. you were very annoyed about the 30s. The 30s took forever. Yes, it was the time of the Great Depression. Exactly. And all the 40s <laughs> flew by. Flew by, yeah. as we're nearly at 150. That's mad. We are going to take our season break after episode. 150 so 150 that is going to be the end of season three big season three finale coming up is there Yes, it's oh, all okay. you, Nick. I do this <laughs> right. to you every year. I better do something with that then. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got it all planned out for you. Oh, good, oh, good, okay. Good, good, good. Um, after that, it means we are taking a little break, so don't be disturbed if there's suddenly a break. People who are listening to this in the future, there's no no difference to you whatsoever. The <laughs> episodes will line up. But yes, 149. Pretty exciting. How are you, Nick? I'm all right. Yes. Yeah, I've got a week off next week. I'm looking forward to that. Ooh, it's going to be fun. exciting, quite exciting. Not quite what I had planned. No, the great decorating is, yeah. is so, unfortunately on hold. So, but yeah, people who have been observing my fabric choices and paints, unfortunately, the the big redecoration has to be put on hold for a short while. Mm. So, I should just be sitting around in my pants all week. <laughs> so, no decorating, no painting, none of that. It's just a week of sitting around eating snacks. Yeah, you did order the fabric, so you can dra- be draped in the fabric in yes, your pants. There eating is snacks. there is a large bolt of fabric sitting in the workroom. <laughs> Waiting to be cut up into different shaped windows. <laughs> so. I mean, it sounds much better than for most people than the idea of decorating for a week. You actually sitting around in your pants. Oh, yeah, yeah, but yes, it'll be nice. It'll be nice, relaxing. I might find a, find a, some PlayStation games. I, might, oh. I haven't played a game for ages on the PS4, so oh, I might do yes. that. Well, I played a game recently, The Excavation of Hobbs Barrow. Oh, you were talking about that on the Switch? Pixelated, sort of old style game. Oh, it's creepy. Might creepy. buy a Switch. Yeah, buy a Switch. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Why yeah, not? Why not? Any poisonings this week? Mm hmm. No, it's been too busy at the yeah. moment. So no, I'm going to go no. Well, a, a couple of things very quickly. Oh. Um, if, if there's rumblings, it's because someone is drilling next door. Yes, unexpected drillings. Or a ghost. Or a ghost drilling. That is a, a ghost electrician <laughs> is trying to make their way through. Also, thank you to anyone who has joined us following my TV debut <laughs> at the weekend. That was bizarre. Very, very random. Got a message from Talk TV which is uh, Rupert Murdoch's uh, channel from Talk Radio. Just our sort of thing. Sinead and I are regular, regular viewers. If you have joined us from that appearance, welcome. You're in I, for a shock. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> but if you love murder and, and, and poison and everything, you stay with us. But yes, that was quite bizarre. That was me live on TV talking about Britain's first serial killer in between some rants about Brexit. <laughs> it's just me popping up going, hello. Oh, hello. Hello. Oh, Marianne Cotton. Oh, she was a wrong one. <laughs> Everyone who's joined us from TikTok, you're very, very welcome. Yeah, hello, you, you hello. know what you're in for. So oh, Oh, yes, yes. Lovely, delicious people on TikTok who have been joining us from there. I'm really glad you found us. If you are enjoying our videos, Nick will be making his debut next week. I, I, yeah, I've been threatening this for a while now. Yeah. So it's probably about time before Sinead does actually beat me to death. Yeah, you, um, you're going to be sitting actually... at home in your pants all week. I think that's TikTok gold. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one needs that. <laughs> well, speaking of sitting around in your pants and making questionable TV debuts, I think it is time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. We certainly should. And first up this week, we have the marvellously named Felicity von Kittenberg. Oh my God. <laughs> Uh, Tina Malia. And Rose Piri Sawyer. Lizzie G. Rebecca Moreno. Emily. And Reno Llewellyn. Thank you very much, darlings. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you lovely, lovely, sexy Patreons. We had fun on Patreon this week. Did a big story. We did a big story. Big story for us locals big in old Canterbury. Big local story. Oh, yes, murder in the cathedral. Big old cathedral story. Mm, lots of history. And we had a lot of fun, actually. Oh, that was good. A lot yes. of bit of history. It was great. It was really good fun. Who doesn't love a bit of murder in a church? And your comment about the monks chanting it, it has ruined everybody. It absolutely <laughs> broke them. And I was chuckling about that for days, actually. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Yeah, funny. <laughs> funny. Well, Nick, are you ready? Oh, yes. To drink cocktails and talk about poison? Oh, I could do with a cocktail. Oh, I think it's time. Or we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. Yeah, definitely fancy a cocktail. Okay, let's That's go with the first sort of one. That's the mood. Hooray, hooray, hooray. It is my story this week, but we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell, and it will flavor our cocktail of the week. My story is my pick. Mm. And this week's secret ingredient, Nick, is mm. phosphorus. Phosphorus. I went big. You went big and poisony. I went big, poisony, bold. Yes. If talk uh, TV has taught me nothing. 
<laughs> perfect, perfect ingredient. Some lovely, lovely phosphorus. Yes, it's a little bit of a phosphorus special this yeah. week. And I thought, let's just go with it. Absolutely. So has the phosphorus so, delivery come? So Yes, yes, the... The truck arrived earlier. <laughs> <laughs> very, very slowly <laughs> dripping are, down the street. There are barrels of phosphorus lining the garden. Oh, lovely. Uh, so I've got a selection of red and white phosphorus. Oh, very, oh good knowledge. Good knowledge. That'll come in handy later. Oh, good, good. That's, about, that's about my knowledge of it. So <laughs> right. I, I couldn't tell you the difference. I'm assuming they're different colours, but apart from that, no idea. You would think. <laughs> One would hope, but probably not. It's probably something to do with the molecules. Stop saying that. Now I'm questioning my research. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, with phosphorus. Phosphorus. phosphorus yes. What? What have you come up well, with? Well, I mean, there's not a lot out there that has actually phosphorus as an ingredient, mm. unsurprisingly. Though I was doing some research, and I, it was quite interesting. Phosphate sodas were a big thing before carbonated drinks. <laughs> so in the in the States, well, yeah. predominantly in, the, in America, where you had sort of like um, drinks parlours and things like that. Uh, a soda fountain. Like a soda fountain type thing. Oh, yeah. They were made with phosphates. Oh, and I suppose gave, they were. Yeah, rather than carbonated oh. beverages. And But they, yeah, they, they quickly tailed off once sort of Coca-Cola and stuff like that came along mm. and the sort of ice cream parlours and things like that took over. Yeah. But yeah, they were the original sort of sodas. That's interesting. I haven't got any of those. No, no no phosphates here. No yeah. no phosphates here. No phosphates here. Okay, probably the explodey death was Yeah, the, and there the are problem. a couple of cocktails called like red phosphorus and vanilla phosphorus and white phosphorus and they all just sound dreadful oh do they yes <laughs> <laughs> well take this much gin and this much vodka and that much rum and put some gatorade and put some Ooh. sour mix and do this and then they just sound horrible <laughs> <laughs> but they glow but they, gator- but they, gatorade they're... is very glowy well i did try and look at a glowy thing yeah i thought oh could we do a glowy thing i didn't have time to get glowy things in unfortunately did you just get some glow sticks that we can wave around Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh. <laughs> Failed miserably <laughs> on that. Do you not have some from your old raving days? Uh, not that not that alive anymore. <laughs> They've still got any glow power in them. They'd be long since dead by now. <laughs> you just dead get and pour wizened. Through, <laughs> pour through your stuff. You've got glow sticks and that sort of, what, what is it, the, the high-vis jacket. Yeah. No shirt with a whistle. Till dawn. Oh, it was a good look. <laughs> I have never done such a thing. How dare you impugn my reputation? (laughs) No, you were much more leather and feathers kind of person. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know why that's just sprung to mind. Have you heard the new, um, have you heard the German Eurovision intro? No, I've not heard any. It's called Glitter and Blood. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know why leather and feathers made me think of that. (laughs) Leather and feathers, glitter and blood. Yeah, but it's this mad sort of heavy rock thing called glitter and blood. And it's like, oh, bloody brilliant. I always love Germany's entry in the Eurovision. It's coming soon and none of us can afford to see it. No, no, absolutely. Anyway. Enough about that. Okay, so we're not having anything that's We're not having phosphorus. any of those. Nothing glowy, and glowy will become obvious soon. Yeah. But uh, well, what have you what come up with, What we are sir? having, a matchstick Sazerac. I knew you were going to go match. I match. knew um, you were going to go match. Matchstick Sazerac. Okay, so Well, match- the picture you put up was a match. Yes, because it's hard to sort of show phosphorus rather than just the, <laughs> but, the, the periodic table. <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> But yes, match. And also, it does tie in with the story a bit. Well, I should hope so. Yes, yes. A matchstick Sazerac. Matchstick we love Sazerac. a Sazerac. Well, this, is, this is our third Sazerac variation. I know. It's almost as if you're biased. Almost as if I, as if I like them. <laughs> I like the idea. Well, I think it is high time for us to sashay into the poisoner's cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick, we have the matchstick Sazerac. Yeah, we do. Now, this one, you, you shouted various things at I me did. from the kitchen and then went, no, never mind. Yeah, well, come on, look. And then, oh, no, it's no, 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 no. Oh, it didn't work. And then you were going, no, it kept going, can you see that? No, it looks like a lovely drink. <laughs> it looks like a lovely sazerac style drink in, the, yeah. in a very nice new glass. New glasses. Drink. See, because I didn't have enough glasses. I IKEA just... glasses <laughs> mm-hmm, with a big old lump of ice. Yeah. But you, sa- you said smell it. Yeah, Okay. I did. It's It's got a, it has a smell. Has a smell. I don't know what it is though i'm oh, i'm awful sometimes on the spot like this like I, my, my instinct is to go nail varnish remover it's not, it's I, can, not I can promise you it's not which makes it remover. sound awful but something fruity that's not <laughs> fruity in there well, let's let's give it a go should we taste it and make this stop uh, yeah <laughs> all right cheers and cheers stick sazerac mm-hmm. it's good I mean, it's good it's good oh hang on what's happening what's happening oh there's an after burn for the vodka. That's actually interesting. Oh, that is. So Sazerac, uh, lovely, smooth, got a got a dusting of absinthe in it, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. No, that one, that one had a, 
a, a lingering feeling of something dangerous. What the oh, hell? Oh, that's is interesting. That? Yeah. Well, okay. What I'm going to do when we when we break for an, I'm going to make one without a secret ingredient. Okay. And then we're going to compare and contrast. Right. So a normal Sazerac has rye, absinthe, and uh, and vermouth in it. Is it? Is it? No. Oh, no. God, I can never remember. <laughs> so a Sazerac is basically there are a few different ways to make it. Mm-hmm. Some people say cognac. Um, was the original sort of French cognac shipped over to New Orleans. Other people, yep, yeah, use, uh, say, rye, bourbon. This actually uses, uh, well, shall I, shall I reveal? No, wait. Calvados. No. Fuck. <laughs> the confidence there. I was so sure. Yeah. There is an aftertaste when you see is it. Like, is it a good one? It's not a bad one. It's yeah. just a lot. This is a spiky. That's the only way I can describe it. The aftertaste is spiky on the tongue. Yeah. I absolutely agree. And I don't know if it's from the secret ingredient or not. No, so this Sazerac is actually using uh, scotch. Oh, okay. It's using scotch. uh, So a mix of scotch and um, bourbon. Nice. In this one with the sugar, the pechos, bitters, and some angostura and things like that you would have in a traditional Sazerac. Mm -hmm. Also a spritz of absinthe. Nice. What makes this one different is that I've smoked the glass. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Using matchsticks. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. So, so oh, that's why I, I, I heard that, none of that. That's why I was what I was calling because when I uh, I'd done that and I put the ice cube in and you could actually see the smoke. Okay. Above, sort of floating above the drink because what you do basically is say so you, you you have your matchstick, Turn you light it, get down. get it get it burning, blow the matchstick out. And then I put it on a little candle thing and then turn mm. the, up, the glass upside down. So as the match continues to smoke, it goes into the glass. Uh, before that, I gave the glass a spritz of absinthe. So the, the inside was coated with absinthe. So hopefully the, yeah, that smoke would sort of have something to mm. sort of stick to. And then I made the rest of the drink, flip the glass over, and the, the, you could see the, sort of the smoke swirling in the bottom of the, ah. the empty glass and then put your big chunky ice cube in and then pour the, the drink in. Unfortunately, by that time, most of the smoke had then since dissipated. So it was difficult oh, It was difficult to sort of get on camera, on film. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, perhaps it's, a, it's like a psychosomatic thing because I know it's in there, but I, th- I think I can taste it. Or I think I can certainly smell it. Yeah. That sort of smoky match. Well, I don't know if I get smoky from it. I mean, now you've said it, that I'm oh, getting smoke. Maybe it's a scotch, to be honest. I've purposely chosen a not a, it's not heavily, a heavily Isle peaty scotch because I thought that would be too much with smoke. But there's definitely a, a slightly sort of acridy sort of yes. thing, which I think is the smoke, which I, d- I don't find particularly unpleasant. Um, I actually quite... Is it phosphorus poisoning? This, this, this is it. <laughs> I mean, this, this could be the way we go. It could um, be the way we go. <laughs> But um, yeah, but even without that, I think this would be a very, very decent drink. Yeah, it's very tasty and it'll, it'll get you there. So matches today are made from a variant of phosphorus. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, that's a really roundabout way of saying so it's, it's more red phosphorus rather than white phosphorus. And we're going to come on to that in a bit. But it's still got it in there. So have you, you've killed us. <laughs> well, I've not sort of ground up hundreds of matches. and sort Haven't of, you? And, and put them, dissolve them into the drink. Isn't that how you make meth? Is that matches? Or something, I don't know. Did I see that in Breaking Bad or did I make that up? I don't know. I think you might have made that up. Isn't it just Sudafed? I don't know. Load, I, load I remember seeing sort of people scraping matches. Perhaps I, well, I don't know, random dream. So I don't, it's definitely got something to it, but I don't know if it's the scotch yeah. that's changing That's things. what I say. So we, well, I should do one which is unsmoked. Okay. And then we will <laughs> compare and contrast. We're going to have several Sazeracs tonight. <laughs> I have to edit this episode at some point and I want that's to make it. tomorrow job. <laughs> Well, I think it's delicious. Good. It's very rare that we have a spiky drink. With the matchstick Sazerac firmly in hand, spikes and all. Are you ready for a story? Ooh, go on then. Oh, hurrah. As I said, it is a bit of a phosphorus special this week. Every now and then I roll out my patented specials. <laughs> where I've got lots of stories and I think they're not a whole episode's worth. And then I think, wait a minute, let's delve deep. Let's make it a special. Let's delve deep into the history of phosphorus because there are several really good stories associated with phosphorus. Not much is known about his childhood. (laughs) Actually, there's quite a lot known about phosphorus's childhood and you will enjoy that. Good, good. The early makings of a cocktail, some might say. But yes, dear old phosphorus, the 15th element... Okay. Mm, devil's element, it's called. Is it? It is. Shouldn't that be sulfur or something like that? But they call it the devil's element because it because it burns and it's a bit glowy <laughs> at times. <laughs> I was, well, I suppose what's fo- sulfur called? The devil's bitch. I don't know. <laughs> Brimstone. Brimstone. There we are. Brimstone. It's called that. It's got a much cooler name. 
But yes, the cull of a deadly creature reportedly discovered by a man trying to make gold out of his own urine. Well, as one does. As one does. Yeah. So this is the origins of phosphorus. Now, phosphorus, a powerful poison. It has made appearances in Agatha Christie. One very notable one in a very spooky way. Okay. So phosphorus was... Cover your ears if you don't want to hear the plots or the twists <laughs> of any Agatha Christie murder mysteries. Um, I think it's Dumb Witness that phosphorus okay. made a feature because someone was conducting a seance. The victim was at a seance and then there was a glow oh. around her body. And everyone was like, oh my God, it's a ghost. Ooh, it's ectoplasm coming out of her. And actually it was because she'd taken phosphorus and it was glowing a little bit. Oh, I don't know. I'm sure that's more, more like a uranium sort of side effect or something. <laughs> Harder to get hold of. <laughs> phosphorus, another poison that was prescribed as a medicine, oh, yeah. mixed in with strychnine, obviously. Oh, of course, do the world of good. Oh, yeah, yeah. A world of good. It treats you very well. Obviously, you, you reduce it in the body. It helps to grow the jaw and the teeth, but it also can fuck shit up as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a technical term. So let's go back to the origins, the uh, the childhood of phosphorus. <laughs> Indeed, it was Hennig Brand in the 17th century who was an alchemist and was convinced, having probably tried everything, Everything. He's going to boil his own wee to get gold. Why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Desperate times. It's got to come from somewhere. Measures. Gold yeah, yeah, comes yeah. from somewhere. A gallon, buckets and buckets and buckets of wee his assistant I mean, gathered. Wee is well used in history. It is. So used for many, many things. An interesting leap to go, will urine produce gold? I mean, but then someone else leaped into, will urine tan leather? Will yeah. <laughs> so, someone, someone goes, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it produces lots of good things. Yeah. We never usually the thing that people set it out. Not, to, but to produce. unfortunately, not gold. No, not gold, not gold. So he collected many buckets of wee. Uh, he let it stagnate, so worms uh, grew in them. Worms growing wee? Apparently, they did. Oh, I, I've not. I must have been. I've not left a bucket of wee out for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Probably maggots or something. Just left it out. Just left yeah. it out to stagnate. They wanted to get really ripe, and then it was a process of boiling it down into a paste. A yep. nice paste, and then burning it, and that produced the white solid, a red oil, and a black and gold. paste. And gold! Not, not gold. No. no, they were waiting for that color to Boo. come up. No, white, red, and black. And they noted that the white solid tasted salty. Why? <laughs> Well, you've got to experiment. You've got to, you've got to figure these things out. I do think that's the assistant as well. Like yeah. He's been oh, gotcha. the buckets of wee going, you taste it. Taste it. Taste it. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it tastes salty. Mm, interesting. Tastes wee like. <laughs> <laughs> no further notes on this day. <laughs> but through multiple, multiple burnings and boilings, a substance was produced that had an interesting side effect. Killed people. No, the assistant wasn't dead by then. I think you're going to blame him having to drink buckets of <laughs> urine, probably. Will that produce gold? No, no, no. It would. It glowed in the dark. Um, always this, handy. Which is incredible for the time. I mean, that would have been quite magical. Yeah. Now First that's... time to see a glow-in-the-dark thing. Yeah. That'd be... Ooh, witches here. It is a paste that glows, that actually glows, and that, that that's what phosphorus does. Was it, it solid in. green? It was a thing of purest <laughs> green... No, it wasn't. But they named it Phosphorus, the Greek for light bringer. Yes, indeed. Light bearer. Yeah. Bringer, bearer. Bringer, bearer, same thing. Bear no, it's not. You bring some light or you bear some light? Well, you bear it to somewhere. I mean, I suppose. Bringing sort of implies it's a gift. Bearing it's in like, this is mine, you can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> it's my life, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I would interpret yeah. it, yes. <laughs> so obviously phosphorus has uh, has evolved from its urine experimenting days. Been refined and developed over the years. Now, uh, it, was, it was discovered through many very painful and upsetting experiments that you cannot use phosphorus as a light source. <laughs> Because it's very explodey. Not ideal around flames. Highly flammable. Highly, yeah. highly flammable. So trying to put it in a lamp, this will guide my way, bang, death. Um, anywhere near any kind of spark or any kind of raising temperature, it will... Yeah, make ink flammable. out of it, make it a book. Oh, right. With okay. glow, glowy letters. Yes, again, very flammable, explodey. Well, don't don't burn your book. Don't hold it near a candle, uh, yeah. which is what everyone read by back in the well, day. Well, if it's glow in the dark, you don't really need a candle, <laughs> do you? It's the whole point of having glow in the dark. I don't need a flame. Are you fully going into that kind of right secret messages in glow in the dark ink? No, I was thinking, <laughs> I'm just going to read a book. I don't want to go downstairs. My candles are downstairs. Right. I don't want to go downstairs. I'm all cosy and comfy in bed. <laughs> I, op I open my book. And it glows. And ah. I can read the book. Well, there might have been another problem with that. Yeah. If you had managed to have glow-in-the-dark ink, yeah. which was always the dream, it stank. 
That's less fun. Absolutely horrific smell. It's commonly said to smell garlicky. The great Dr. Catherine Harkup, who has been a guest on the show, has written in the past saying, yes, people say it's garlicky. She's worked with phosphorus. She's like, there's no smell on the earth like it. It's just (laughs) horrific. Right. That's less good for a book in bed. No, and not good for lighting as well. So even if you don't explode from from fiery (laughs) death, then ew, ew, not so great. No, it's terrible. It's terrible. Now, again, another little side note here. Phosphorus for a while was sort of very vaguely linked with spontaneous combustion. Nice. Now, I love a few stories about spontaneous combustion to the point where I kind of want to do an episode on it. Yeah, but it's... I have crossed that. That has crossed my mind before. Mm, mm. So I remember reading those books of great mysteries from mm. the world and those <laughs> famous pictures of like ashen oh, well, yes, lumps. So, yes. But there's a foot. There's a foot because someone spontaneously combusted. Oh, it reminds me. It's a, a tangent. No, no, I'm... go, go, go. go, go, go. <laughs> uh, back in the days when I used to smoke, don't smoke, it's bad for you. Um, <laughs> I was out in Hong Kong on a work thing mm-hmm. once and I was going to, and I bought a pack of camels, my cigarette of choice at the time. And this was just for when they were introducing, you know, the um, the pictures of horrible things on packs of cigarettes yes, and such like. And there was one and I, I, I kept this pack for years and years because it was such a brilliant image. There was a skeleton in an armchair. <laughs> I think you've told me this. Yeah, yeah. sort of skeleton, skeleton sitting in an armchair with sort of hand holding cigarette. Yeah. As if sort of like, don't fall asleep with your cigarette because you'll catch on fire. But um, the cigarette was fine. The cigarette was fine. The skeleton was entirely articulated with a hat. <laughs> 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 and it was the hat that was like, yes. So it's entirely perfectly sort of articulated skeleton sitting in a chair. Apparently this chap fell asleep with his cigarette, set his chair on fire, <laughs> burned him to a crisp left the bones pearly white <laughs> and entirely yes articulated but his hat survived his hat survived <laughs> those fireproof hats fireproof hats he he is him and his asbestos hat <laughs> that is brilliant who thought of I that know, brilliant i'd say i kept that packet for years because it made me i pissed myself in the street looking at this um it's, I, somewhere over the years it went walk about and i threw it out or something but... i understand the early marketing approach to that because you've got to convey a message very quickly yeah. whereas obviously later they use shock tactics and go let's just use real images yeah. because fair enough but back then like we can't use a dead body let's use clive the skeleton that we have as a prop exactly it was like some sort of high school sort of <laughs> plastic skeleton that's been posed on this this armchair it's funny it that brilliant. you should say that though about spontaneous combustion i'm not going to go too often on a tangent on spontaneous combustion because i feel like it's a whole separate thing but people questioned the cases of this phenomena as it was called about how the human body could could burn but in some of those instances you know the clothing was okay or like mm. some of the, the things they were holding were unaffected. So it was all like, oh my God, what's happened to this person? That's what led people to think they've been cursed or it's the devil's fire or things like that. A few people started to try and draw conclusions that phosphorus might have been involved because phosphorus is produced in the body. And they go, phosphorus, it, 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 it's Bernie. It's Bernie <laughs> stuff. That's the extent of the science. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because um, I did some Googling trying to find anything that kind of was like, no, uh, nope, no, nope, no, 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 nope. no, no. There was a story in the Manchester Guardian in 1825. And this is taken from a piece in the Guardian about spontaneous combustion. And this is a little side, but I like it. It's like, Dr. Trail has recently discovered a peculiar kind of oil in the human blood, which is highly flammable, which is explaining spontaneous combustion. The oil is chiefly observed in the blood of persons who have been addicted to drinking ardent spirits. Oh. So it goes on to kind of just conclude, if you're a piss head, then you'll catch fire. <laughs> okay. Mm. It's yeah. probable that this discovery may tend to elucidate the hitherto inexplicable phenomenon of the spontaneous combustion of living human bodies. Right. <laughs> and that's not just somewhere falling asleep with a glass of vodka, spilling yeah. the vodka on themselves. And then with a the Cigarette in the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bernie death. <laughs> then Bernie death. Yes. Uh, one we should come back to, but yes, phosphorus in the body, not, not known to make you suddenly no. burst into flames, even though some people would have it known that that is the cause of it. As we said, with phosphorus, even though it helps us to, to grow bones and teeth, it also comes with a terrible, terrible curse. <laughs> As to all the good things. I do, I do. One of the most gruesome stories associated with phosphorus. Do you want to have a guess at it? Is there a phrase you might be familiar with? Well, I mean, there's... The the, the famous one that springs to mind is the Matchstick Girls. Yes, the story of the Matchstick Girls. Is it Fossy Jaw? Fossy Jaw, absolutely right. 
fossy jaw. This is where the white vapors, in so many words, of phosphorus seep into the jawbone and completely fuck and, it up. Yeah, make your face fall off. Destroy it. Um, so working with phosphorus, as people did in factories for, for, for decades and decades and centuries even, working with phosphorus, if you were around it for too long, white phosphorus in particular, it is going to mess up your body. It's yeah. going to seep into the bones and particularly it goes for the jaw. So it would start with a toothache. It would start with people complaining of toothache. They'd go to the doctor. The doctor would go, just take the tooth out. And they'd be like, okay, take painkillers, send you on your way. But soon holes develop in your jaw. And these holes are then seeping very disgusting pus. Yeah. Foul smelling, awful, separating wounds. Just, and then your teeth are falling out. The bones are rotting slowly, steadily until some or all of the lower jaw predominantly yeah. has to be removed. Yeah, falls off, drops off, or yeah. just, and you've got awful pictures of it all swollen. You really have, absolutely. Yeah, there's some of the pictures are dis- oh, horrid. Horrific. 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 Yeah. So is, is that because people are eating stuff that's covered in like phosphorus dust or something? So that's why it's getting into your your mouth just breathing it in just just breathing just breathing it in yes you can be eating it as well as um well the people who worked in these factories would be surrounded by phosphorus yeah. for up to 10 hours a day and they were not allowed to go into break rooms to go and eat their lunch so you have to then get your your, your yeah. pat lunches out <laughs> and eat around phosphorus so also when the fossy jaw sets in it glows sort of green white in the dark so nice. that's horrifying for yeah. your children. <laughs> yeah. I remember there's, there are stories of when, um, it's slightly different, with, with Radium mm. was came out, mm. which man, you... Um, Another story about the Radium girls. Yeah, well, they, absolutely. And they used to paint watch dials and things like that with Radium to make those all glow in the dark. And they used to uh, like paint their teeth and things like that to practical jokes with their boyfriends and stuff like that. They used yeah. to paint things on their teeth and stuff. And then their face fell off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, well, actually, the, the worst thing was is just they they had the brushes. Yeah. And they just, and they just lip them, you know, yeah. kind of like, oh, make them all pointed. So yeah. they sort of suck the brush tip as you would do. Yep. And, and then, then just radium, 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 radium. 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 And, then, and then hair falls out yeah. and, then, and then death. And then death. But yes, where do you get a hefty, hefty dose of phosphorus poisoning back in the day? It is, of course, in the matchmaking process factories match factories what a lovely lovely victorian tradition there's so many stories like fictional stories but also a couple of stories that we've covered where there's a match factory the match factory because it no, sort of have we, had a match factory? we have we have we've had, had a story plenty, we've had a couple of brush factories oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who could forget the sexiest factories of them all <laughs> exactly. we but have had a match factory uh, there it, it figures also in a in a work of fiction that i really like as well so i'm, I'm hoping i'm not amalgamating the two but we've definitely talked about match factories yep. big production and you know mm. massively in demand matches suddenly ooh, everyone wants everyone some. wants a match you and make their got... sazeracs of an evening <laughs> that's the main thing <laughs> that's, that's the main export for matches is, is sazeracs <laughs> it is um particularly strike anywhere matches before mm. you had to just rub two bits of wood together to light a cigarette but now you have strike anywhere matches and white phosphorus is used predominantly on these matches and so you can just like you know th- those old timey films of just well, like, yeah. you do on a brick or something yeah. like that flick, and, flick yeah. your match a logo at a wall yeah. or on a child or anything and then light your cigar and walk around town looking cool looking cool absolutely so um interesting brand name for one of the most popular uh types of match lucifers Oh, nice. Lucifer's because the white phosphorus was mixed with sulfur in the mix and it gave a smell of sulfur. Yeah, that'll when do you it. struck it. Yeah. Oh, good marketing there. Yeah, good marketing. definitely. But yes, you've got matches dipped in sulfur, white phosphorus, potassium, chlorate, antimony, sulfite, powdered glass, and colouring. I mean, all the good things in life. All the good <laughs> things. What a factory to work in. <laughs> Lining up they were. But yes, demand for production was incredibly high in the 1800s. So factory workers could be producing around 10 million matches a day. It's a lot of matches. And these are sweatshops. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Absolutely. They're Horrendous. not nice places to work. You no. Can get work, steady work, regular work. A lot of women are working oh, in yeah, there. Absolutely. Predominantly women. Predominantly women. But yeah, you are paid a paltry sum and you have to supply most of the goods yourself. You know, the wood is there and the phosphorus they give you, but you've got to supply your own glue. And you've got to supply your own string for putting the matchbox together. And for- you would be fined repeatedly through the day for any tiny little thing. Yeah, over a dropped ten- a match on that. So that's coming yeah. out of your wage. Oh, Absolutely. yeah. If you a burnt match, yeah. something like five shillings. Yeah. Yeah. Which is enormous. A More ten than hour- a box of matches. <laughs> a box of matches, you were shot. <laughs> but yeah, a 10 hour shift, you'd be working in the factory. If your bench was untidy, fined. If you had dirty feet, 
mm. untidy. A lot of people couldn't afford shoes. They're coming in there, yeah. and but you, 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 I've had to walk through mud and shit to get here, but your feet are dirty. Who's looking? Yeah, who cares? Yeah, being late, anything like that, fine, 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 fine. So people are basically earning yeah. nothing. And one such factory, mm-hmm. the evil ones, <laughs> Bryant and May. Now, there is a company today, Bryant and May, they they have no bearing on... They bought the name or something. One of the biggest suppliers in the UK and beyond. Their match factory started, they're a pair of Quakers who started it. But their production became so strong, they had demand and they were exporting soon. So mm. obviously they've got plenty of workers. And they are ruthless in terms of how they treat their staff. They do not care a jot for anyone's health and safety. Now, the problems with white phosphorus have been documented for many years. Certainly about 20, 30 years previously, there have been reports now mm. coming out saying white phosphorus can, can cause fossil jaw. This, this is damaging. Um, first case that was heavily reported was back in 1838, but we're now in the late 1850s. Bryant and May are aware that people's jaws are falling off. But well, if they choose to work here, they know the risks. Absolutely. It's their own choice to mm. work here. If they don't want to work here, then they don't have to. And if a single worker complains of a toothache, then they demand they go and get the tooth extracted or they are fired. Yeah. Get rid of it. Get rid of the evidence. There were treatments. There were ways of dealing with this, but they did not want to know about it because switching from white phosphorus to red phosphorus even or to, to other sources... More expensive. More expensive. Absolutely. More expensive. It's all about the money. And they didn't have to. Yeah. It was you know, not their problem if people get sick. So it's now 1888. Okay. Jack the Ripper is tearing through jaws. Now, many countries by now had banned the use of white phosphorus in factories, but not the UK. Not the UK. No, we shall not. cling on. We shall cling yeah. on. Who should do the old ways? <laughs> and in the face of this continual use of this really, really damaging product... There are articles now being written, and famously, an article comes out from women's rights activist Annie Besant, who lays out the horrifying conditions of the match factory girls, the, what they're working in, and how damaging phosphorus is, and all of the horrors that these people are facing. The workers read this. Shit, really? <laughs> really? That's what happened to me. Bryant and May read this. On the 2nd of July, 1888, they read this and they go, oh, no, this won't do. And they go, they go to the factory floor and demand all of their workers sign a document that confirms that her writings are false. Right. Yeah. Annie Besson, no, none of that's true. We're all very happy. We love it here. So the workers refusing, probably one of them uh, can't open their mouth. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Can't say anything. Jaw drops off on the floor. Brian and May go, okay, fine. You're fired. They pick one woman out, you're fired, you're dismissed for not signing this paper. <laughs> ah, yes. Let that be a lesson to the rest <laughs> of you. Absolutely. Not letting your jaw fall off. This couldn't possibly backfire. Hmm. Okay, it's a lesson all right. 1,400 workers down their tools and walk out on strike. It becomes the match girl's strike. Good for them. Yeah. Yeah. International Women's Day this week. Woohoo! Yeah. Right and men going, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, we'll get the sack girl back. It's fine, it's fine. We'll patch up her jaw. We'll just say it's lovely, lovely, lovely. Good as new, good as new. <laughs> They're like, no, we're not no. coming back in. Don't think so. The women stand their ground. They demand fair wages. They demand the repayment of unfair fines and having fines stopped completely. They go to Annie Besson. They go to MPs. The noise of the strike rumbles and rumbles and grows louder and louder. And Bryant and May do not want the bad publicity. And they don't want to lose favor with the MPs. Obviously, they're very pally with the government. You know, they're a huge industry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we need to calm this down. Eventually, eventually, talks are negotiated between the main women who walk out and the leaders of the group and all parties they agree they agree to end the unfair fines they agree to a better complaints process where it's not just them the foreman (laughs) going none for you (laughs) a box that goes straight into the bin (laughs) (laughs) someone comes up with a jaw in their hand Mm, okay and also letting them eat their food away from the phosphorus that'll do it that was it can we have another room away from the poison So they're not good sandwiches dusted with poison, as you said. There we are. The strike ends on the 16th of July. Phosphorus would continue to be used in factories until 1901. It's still hung on in there. 
for Brian and May, um, they eventually changed their tune because of the bad press. You know, it doesn't go away for a few years. And then, well, it, 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 then they start using it on the trenches in World War One, <laughs> which is <laughs> much more fun. <laughs> well, yeah, it's white phosphorus is banned in 1910, and they go, "Excuse me, yep, <laughs> take we'll away. take that to the army." But phosphorus gas can, of course, be used to kill intentionally, Nick. Not the easiest one to wield, but it was a favourite tool of the Merry Widow of Windy Nook. And I think before we get to our story, it's time for another drink. Probably. And more sausages. Sausages. (laughs) Okay, Nick. Yeah? We have our drinks. Well, we have another Sazerac. We do. But a non-smoky one. A non-smoky one, so let's have a go. I'm going to say there's definitely a difference. Yeah. 100%. 100%. There's definitely a difference in there. I'm not getting spikiness. I don't no. know whether my taste buds have been dulled now. By the sausages. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all right, guys, full disc- we need to eat dinner before we record this. Because Nick very kindly brought some snacks earlier. And we have done nothing but hoover yeah. them up. Try, yeah, so there'll be a lot of munching going on through Literally, this episode. Uh, throwing cocktail sausages in our faces, little hammy, cheesy roll-ups, nuts. <laughs> that, that don't have a nut before you record. They're, they're everywhere. <laughs> So maybe it's that, but um, I do think there's none of the spikiness that yeah. was there. And I so, like the spikiness. Well, yeah. So it I, makes a difference. I think it might. Yeah, I was, I was surprised how much of a difference it has made. But yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. I mean, it, can... it's not unpleasant without. Oh, it's, um, it's a lovely, lovely drink. Bit of smoke. Yeah, go with that. 100% guys, try it. See if you find a difference with it. But we have our drinks. Yes. Would you like to hear the tale of the Merry Widow of Windy Nook? I think we probably should. Because it does sound like a fairy story. It does sound very quaint and very twee. Merry Widow of Windy Nook. Windy Nook. It's a place. Yeah, I get that. It's it's a real place. Yes. I didn't make it up. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine if I did that once. I just went rogue. I mean, we could. Because really, is anyone... Who's who's going to know? Well, actually, our our, our listeners would. They would go, that's not a real place. But then who's who's Googling all the places that we say each week? I'm not. You're not. (laughs) But anyway. I trust you implicitly. Hooray! <laughs> All of this is absolutely true. It's absolutely true. 100%. So it is the story of the Merry Widow, Mary Wilson. So Mary Wilson, born in County Durham in 1889. Ooh. She was Jack the Ripper. She was Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Very, very young Jack the Ripper. Very, very young. She controlled people with her mind from the womb. That's dark. It's weird. <laughs> Now, not much is known about her childhood (laughs) beyond all the murders. It was windy. It was windy. No, she had a pretty modest upbringing as far as we can see. Not from a wealthy family because she went into service. At a fairly young age, she would lie about her age a lot in later years. Okay. So we we think she was born in in 1889. It could have been many, many years before that. (laughs) Well, you're 75. And you keep on on telling people otherwise. So one does. One does lie about these things. Well, when your skin looks this good. (laughs) She would end up in the service of the Knowles family. Okay. For the life of me, I could not find out what the Knowles family did. They weren't exceedingly wealthy. They no. were not like high gentry or anything like that. Um, she was probably the charwoman. Mary was a good worker. She was very keen on their son, John Knowles. Okay. So the, her employer's son, he was a chimney sweep in some stories. A labourer, he's called otherwise. Okay. So, which is, So yeah. yes, I mean, so really not... If they're sending their, their son up the chimneys... Mm. Not a wealthy family this to is... employ a servant themselves. Yeah, is mm, okay. Well, that's why I was trying to find out who the Knowles family were yeah. because they say he's a labourer. He could be a foreman. He could be in charge of yeah. a labouring business. He could be in charge of all the chimney suites of Durham. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe. But yes, she was in service there. Fell for John. I like the look okay. of you and your big brush. Yep. Yep. Young man around age. It all comes back to the brush, this, doesn't it? <laughs> There's never a story. It all comes back to the brush. Where there is not a brush involved. The pair hit it off. They began courting and they began a kissing and then they began a sexy sexy and then they <laughs> married in 1914. Now, the pair settled in Windy Nook. Windy Nook. Where is Windy Nook? Gateshead. That's less exciting. Why is that less exciting? Well, less, less exciting. Windy Nook. That sounds rem- lovely and twee and lovely, Gateshead. <laughs> it's like has less of a romantic vibe about it. I, I feel. think back then probably it was a little bit more quaint. Was it than than just the the sprawling metropolis it is now? Okay, gates. So they had some gates with heads on them. Yes. It was a really terrifying place. That's, that's actually, what started it. That's what started it. There's their a, cottage. There's actually a massive wall around Gateshead. <laughs> they they get the heads of their enemies on the gates. 
Yeah, it was yeah. Game of Thrones yeah. city. <laughs> it was a very scary place. Tourists would come by eating an apple going, that place is weird. <laughs> Steer clear Not of that. Not going there again. <laughs> but they settled in Windy Nook with all of their heads. For 40 odd years, nothing happens. I mean, that's nice. That's nice. I, I quite like 40 years for nothing to happen. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be lovely. They have some children. Yeah. Uh, they have some grandchildren. Just poodle along Poodling in Windy along. Nook. Absolutely fine. Quite content. Mm. But then, oh, it's around 1954. For some reason, Mary mm. gets bored of everything. Well, middle-aged. Mm. One, yes, one does get a bit sort of, oh, what could have been? So going from like, oh, I'm perfectly happy to... Huh. I could have had a life. I could have had adventures. Mm. I could have been in love. The one-horse marriage seems to bore her a little. Uh, the one-horse in... marriage? Yes. Is that a thing? Did she marry a one-horse horse town or a one-horse marriage? Oh, right. I was, I was doing a little, little oh, were play you, on words Were there. you? Yeah. It worked well for you. It's very clever. You wouldn't understand. Uh, no, probably not. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> she married a horse? What's going on there? <laughs> she did. <laughs> so, middle age. I'm really, really bored. I know. I'm going to marry a horse. <laughs> so, spice well, things up a bit. <laughs> 40 years later, she'd be like, this, this pantomime horse outfit of yours is really not working for me. <laughs> but her marriage, uh, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> but then they take in a lodger. Oh, oh, is he a sexy, sexy lodger? Oh, he's a lodger. He's a lovely lodger. He's, a little, he's a little older. He's oh, a painter. Yeah. A painter. Oh, yeah. Draw me like one of your French girls. <laughs> a painter by the name of John Russell. And he's, he's nice and they become very friendly and very chatty and very shaggy <laughs> of all hours. <laughs> and wouldn't you just know it, in 1955, Mary's husband John dies suddenly. Oh, God. Of These TB. Happened. TB, yeah. tuberculosis. Okay. He's 76. Oh, wow. Is that a good innings? I mean, exactly, exactly. Yeah, old people die. Old people die, as she would say. Oh, no. Oh, no. But now Mary is free to shack up with oh, John no. Russell. Oh, no. Oh, no. What a terrible thing. So, like, oh, oh, lovely, sexy lover. Let's move in with him. Is he a horse? He is. He's hung like a horse. <laughs> <laughs> if legends are true. Mm. <laughs> the legends that we've just made up. <laughs> I told you you should believe everything that's in this story, mate. <laughs> yes. So they shack up. It's okay. He's there to comfort her. He well, already lives there. Comforting. Her hour of need. Five months after her husband, John, dies, yes. she shacks up with John Russell, the Ooh. painter. She marries him. Now, some say that they just moved in together. Others say that they were married. Okay. But all is well. All is well. They Delightful. are together. Until John Russell mysteriously drops dead in 1956. Well, people do. People do. But a year later... And he's an, he's, an, he's an older chap as well. 65. Yeah, I mean, he's had it coming. Yep, natural causes. Yep. Now, this may be a bit weird. Why would she kill off two men so close to her so soon? I mean, she did inherit 42 pounds. I mean, my God. Mm. I would do mm. a lot to inherit 42 pounds. Mm, that was a lot. That was a lot. That was a lot. Okay, well, there's no point moping about all over the place. You need to move on, Mary. You need to just find someone else Absolutely. to shack up with. And sure enough, in 1957, Mary is married to husband number three or two, depending, but let's call it number three, Oliver Leonard, a retired estate agent. Okay, now here is a nice man with a good pension. Always handy. Oh, they can settle down. They can live happily. She can put these unfortunate sudden deaths of a previous husband behind mm, them. Absolutely. All is well. Twelve days later. Twelve days? Days. That's impressive. He did. Yeah, that's yeah, that's ambitious. <laughs> you're, you're lost for words. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking, well, that's, that's bordering on the careless, I feel. Apparently, he had fallen ill. He had fallen ill one night. Uh, Mary Wilson had called in a neighbour um, and said, uh, can, he's not very well. Can you come round and look? And the neighbour comes in and goes... There's no, dead. no, no, he's, he's, he's not very well. Maybe get a doctor. I don't know what I can do right now. And then she's like, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> His jaw has fallen off. <laughs> His head has been cleaved in by an axe. <laughs> and it's on, that, it's on the city gates. <laughs> <laughs> by the morning he is dead after uh, they've yeah. visited. Okay, fine. Uh, Mary inherits 50 English pounds. Ooh. Mm. It's not a lot. No. Even in the 50s, it's not a lot. It's really not a lot. But it's enough for what? A nice slap up meal somewhere. It's enough for Mary. It's enough for Mary? Wow. Mm. Mary drives her eyes with pound notes, no doubt. <laughs> She's determined to move on. Move on mm. again. It's all right. She moves right into a bungalow, also in Windy Nook, owned by a man named Ernest Wilson. 
hence her surname. Where do we think this where, is going? Where could this possibly be going? <laughs> she strikes up a friendship with Ernest. Ernest, run away, Ernest, run away. Oh no, but Ernest is 76. Oh God. And she is a nice lady. She She's not a great looker, but she's, she's <laughs> friendly. She's got 50 quid. She's got 50 quid. I have a feeling he's not going to hit 77. <laughs> and they decide to start a relationship. It's wonderful. It's a good match. Kind, thoughtful. Ernest also has £100 in assets and a new great big life insurance policy. Oh, how handy. How she knows that or finds it out, I don't know. Maybe that's just the opening gambit and he's not talked to anyone for long. So he's like, is this how we flirt? (laughs) Yes. I have life insurance. Love me. (laughs) (laughs) But of course, of course, she and Ernest are wed and they have a lovely, lovely wedding reception. Oh, no doubt. And local friends, a nice spread. Good spread, good spread. Good Volivons, spread. chicken Ooh. legs. A oh, volivon. Yeah. A volivon. Oh, yeah, now talking. Sandwiches. Fancy. I don't know if they were volivons there. <laughs> <laughs> it's the old thing, isn't it? Volivons, little volivons. chicken legs, oh, few sandwiches. Yeah, hula a bit, a bit of pineapple and cheese oh, on a stick. Oh, yes, 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 my friend. But definitely some sandwiches. Right, oh, there's fancy. lots of sandwiches there. Got the crust off. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, there's so much food, there's some left over. My God. And a friend says, well, what do you want me to do with the leftovers? And Mary says, keep them for the funeral. <laughs> Oh, that's <laughs> that is absolutely true. That's brilliant. And I did a voice. I didn't know how the voice was going to come out there. I made it very oh well. <laughs> yeah, I love. <laughs> but yeah, he said, "What do you want with it?" Oh no, keep him for the funeral. Yeah, we'll need him soon. <laughs> They'll need him soon. Oh, what? <laughs> People store this. People yeah, store this in, 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 in memory. Walking away, uh, there was a description of Ernest as well, the, the newlywed husband, very happy, always oh, lovely. The manager of a local pub described him. I quite like the way it, this develops, by the way. Larry, who's known, was a cheerful fellow. He was not a heavy drinker, hmm. but he used to come in here for a glass of beer and read the newspapers. Oh, delightful. He never wore socks. Okay. Not even on his wedding day. And neither did he wear a vest or underpants. <laughs> or any clothes whatsoever. <laughs> he was well educated and a good mixer. Right. There's a lot buried in the middle of that, isn't there? There is. There is really. I feel like the landlord of that pub. The landlord knows too much. I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Loved Larry deeply. <laughs> he knew he never wore pants. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was something going on there. I know your body. Face. <laughs> I can tell you're not wearing pants today, are you, Larry? <laughs> <laughs> Just... <laughs> oh. oh, Larry, Larry, Larry. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> the love that dare not just speak its name. So, yes, he knew a lot about old Ernest, Larry. Yeah, so it would seem. But, oh, much to the heartbreak of that pub uh, landlord. He was distraught, I imagine. Within a few months, Ernest is not well. Oh, God. And again, in a pattern, uh, Mary turns up at a neighbor's doorstep and asks, can she spend the night in the house because her husband is not well and the doctor's seeing him and she thinks it's better whether she's pretending that there's germs or anything. Like, can right. I be away from can this? Can I be away from my dying husband, please? Crime scene. Here it is. And they, the, the neighbor goes, oh, okay, yes, please stay over. Maybe the doctor has to, oh, maybe it's all a bit gross. Okay, come in, come in, come in. Next morning, the neighbor, Grace Little, Takes her back to the house, walks back with her. Mm. It's like, oh, let's let, let's check on Ernest. Let's check on Larry. Um, goes in to find Ernest spread out on a table, dead. Oh, impressive. Okay. Right. Oh, Larry's been here, hasn't he? <laughs> 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 the pub landlord was in there. <laughs> so yeah, he's spread out like, oh, oh, uh, you said he was sick. Like, no, no, he's on a table. Just he's okay. Fine. He's laid out. <laughs> That's what he does when he's feeling a bit poorly. He yeah, gets on the gets on the table. It's absolutely fine. So neighbor goes away, going okay. But Mary is positively buoyant around town. Oh, absolutely bopping about. Nothing wrong. Nothing no, wrong doing so her errands. She's chatting away to people. Um, <laughs> she has to go and see the funeral director, obviously. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. And she says to the funeral director, she really should get a discount for sending all this business his way. <laughs> She's not being subtle at this point, I feel. Mm-mm-mm. Really not. And it's in one of the cases, we've talked about it many times, where people throw these comments around mm. and no one does anything. But they come back to bite you. Oh, in Windy Nook, <laughs> everyone is making a mental note yeah, of this. There's a list somewhere. They they forget <laughs> nothing. She arranges Ernest's funeral. She doesn't go. <laughs> Got more important things to do. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Pub landlord is there crying. <laughs> it's at the graveside wailing away. <laughs> Holding his pants. <laughs> You've put him in pants. He never wore pants. <laughs> <laughs> put that in the eulogy. I really don't want to say that. <laughs> 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 
It's too much. <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> Someone's now, dead. Stop laughing. No, no it's I not know. funny. <laughs> Now, if you think this sort of behavior should arouse suspicions, as I said, of course, much gossiping ensues. People are completely astounded by Mary's attitude to her dead spouses. And now they are starting to join the dots. Like, <laughs> how many people have died who have known her, who have wed her? How many husbands has she buried? Whispers like this cannot be mere coincidences. And they start to ripple through the town and through the county. And eventually they reach the ears of the police. And the police go, no, no, OK, we need to look into yeah. this. Yeah, something old's going on This there. taint right. So strange are the circumstances of her various husband's deaths that the police order hubbies th- three and four to be exhumed Ooh. and then to take a closer look at them. I will always say it, always take a closer look before you bury them. <laughs> yeah. We've learned now, mm. now, pretty thorough. Back then, chuck them in the ground. Chuck them around, yeah. We can always dig them up. The worms won't do anything. I suppose back then, there was no... You could, you, there's all that possibility now where the vast majority of people are cremated. Yeah. Once, once, it, once that's happened, you're not getting much, I, many yeah. results out of chests and things. So you have to do all your things beforehand. Back then, it's like, oh, yeah, oh, we can mm. dig them up if we need to. Be thorough, guys. You got one shot at this. Whereas back then, we got a few do overs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> As they examine the bodies of husbands three and four, the bodies are found to contain very high levels of phosphorus. Are they glowing? They just, op- open those those caskets and just it's like the Ark of the Covenant sort of thing <laughs> going on. And their face melts, <laughs> and their jaws rot off. <laughs> it's like, yep, that'll do it. No, they contain phosphorus and wheat grain. Okay. And it's surmised that she has fed them beetle poison. Oh. We don't get a lot of beetle poison. No. We get rat poison. Yeah, a lot of rat poison, but no beetle poison. The words beetle poison, I think, have confused some of the reports okay. from later on. Because some people go down the line of this is cockroach poison. So, okay. so insecticide. But also, beetle poison, what could that be? Well, I was going for poison for beetles, but... Yeah. Uh... So that could be cantharidin. Uh, oh, right, okay. Uh, yes, I see. Yeah. Poison from beetles. From beetles. Not poison to kill beetles. Indeed. Oh, okay, indeed. yes. I see where you're going with that. So, yeah, there's different reports as we go. And it was difficult to determine whether this is hindsight reporting of people yeah. drawing conclusions or the actual accuracy. But either way, it makes it fascinating. It's, it's, it's well, very interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. interesting. What interesting could thing. it be? So, they're going, okay, wheat poison, so, uh, and we'll, we'll come on to the types of poison. Meanwhile, Mary is denying all of this. Pretty, of course. Incredibly cocky in the face of her husband's bodies being dug up. When asked by the local press about what she feels about this, because she's interviewed at the time, says, I'm not worried about what they're saying. I can go to the Blessed Sacrament, I'm a Catholic, tomorrow. I take no notice of this tittle-tattle. <laughs> it's all jealousy. I am not worried about what's going to happen. Okay, jealousy of what? But, very, um, very okay. confident. Yeah. She would also say of her husband, I gave them nothing but kindness. Men like me and I like men. <laughs> Fair enough. You go for it, love. <laughs> Again, I have nothing to hide. I know in my heart that I am completely innocent. So okay. at the trial, the defense apparently tries to claim that the phosphorus is actually because her husbands have been taking sex pills. Okay. A version of Viagra which might be Spanish fly. Yeah, okay. In the 50s. Yeah. Stimulants do little doses of cantharidin. True, true, true. Uh-huh. Yes. So this is why I think you do get some of the confused reports because you have some saying it was pure cockroach poison. It was like rat poison, but cockroach poison. She just like put it in their food. But actually, maybe what it was is that she had dressed up the poison... In giving them pills, going, oh, here's a little bit of... Is uh, it something to help you help you along? They're older men. Yeah. And she's Might need a bit, of, a bit of an assistance. Indeed. Um, it is not long after the Spanish fly murders of 1954. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because that was the 50s. Yeah. yeah, 54 of Arthur Ford. So is it her thinking, okay, this is a handy way of killing people? Or is it just the defence going, oh, the men were taking Viagra and they died accidentally? That's yeah, well, it. Well, and also, I mean... If, if yeah, if the chat, if they were the chaps were taking it, they're probably not going to say no. No, <laughs> <laughs> they got this this woman here. Who, yes, I would like to shag you a lot. Um, take these pills, and I will have lots of sex. Yeah, 
And you go, okay. Absolutely, absolutely <laughs> madam. Yes. Fine. Yeah, so it's 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 quite a compelling oh, yeah, defense. Oh, well, that's interesting. I like that. It is. Well, it, it doesn't work. Oh. Uh, because the prosecution go, fine, she was shoving sex pills into them to kill them. Oh, yeah, well, absolutely. And then they go, oh, no, we hadn't thought of that. Yes, absolutely. Go, yes, it's probably exactly what she did. Yeah. And she killed them but, as a result. Uh, but cutting her to take that route rather than just like arsenic in the the soup or something well yeah if um, if it's true because clearly the defense got that idea from somewhere whether she said that's what happened or where they go okay right there's 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 beetle poison there was a case recently this is what it is where do they get the phosphorus from well yeah <laughs> so- Phosphor- phosphorus is in beetle poison so it's, so it's all in, mixed in together in a, yeah, it's in, in a big so old it pill. is in cockroach poison so it's in some uh, insecticides yeah. So it is. That's where that confusion comes into it. But I think there's a little traces of phosphorus also in some versions of this sex drug. But I, again, I think that's where it's confused because I don't recall Spanish fly containing phosphorus. No, no, exactly. That's what I was thinking. It's, it's fairly lethal in its, in its own regard. So. And this is where we can probably take a step back and go: of all these stories been mixed up? The weird reporting actually doesn't seem to quite make and sense because it's all happening around the same time in that sort of mid fifties sort yes. of bracket. So. It would all have been in the papers. Have they got yeah conflated with each other? So, Indeed. So they all kind of go, oh, it's it's sex drugs, but also yeah. like phosphorus in the phosphorus, body. There's actually phosphorus in was the body. Was there any in there? No. Yes, but but you know maybe it was a phosphorus sex drug that did not take. Yeah. Maybe she had an experimental cheap one. Close <laughs> it out, Willies. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you would. You would buy it. <laughs> he was trying to spice up the sex life. Yeah, that'll do it. Clear the dark. <laughs> Either way, the prosecution go, you don't care what she fucking did. She's a bloody murderer. Well, yeah, she's killed four people. She's so, killed yeah. four people. The jury take 90 minutes, 90 minutes to convict her of murder. She barely flinches at the verdict. Yeah. Cheeks flush a little bit. She is sentenced to hang. She would be the last woman sentenced to death in County Durham. However, due to her age, it was commuted to life in prison. In jail, she continued to be completely jolly and jokey as if nothing wrong had happened. And she would die of natural causes in Holloway Prison in 1962. Later, the bodies of her first two husbands were exhumed. They were also found to have high levels of phosphorus, but they just determined there was no point opening up a new trial. Well, what's the point? She's in jail for the rest of her life. What's the the point of going to that expense? She's in jail for life, always known as the merry widow of Windy Nook. Oh, I like that story. Yeah. Why why haven't we done that one before? (laughs) That's excellent. To be fair with that story, probably the reason we haven't done it is that it's it's quite short. Yeah, it true. is quite short. So hence me making kind of a phosphorus special. It's too good not to do. That's a brilliant story. <laughs> brilliant. But the details... Poor landlord. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Larry. Larry the landlord. No, no, no. He called Ernest Larry. Oh, right. Beg pardon. Uh, the <laughs> landlord. I don't think he had a name. It might have been Alan. No, no just, just landlord. Poor Land- landlord. Landlord. <laughs> Who knew his body. <laughs> Who knew his body so well. So he had been named. <laughs> knew him so well. It's so random. May have made that up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, very short story. And the details, I did search and search and search through stuff and even look for the particular books written on it and, and couldn't find any. Maybe people from the north of England can fill us in. Maybe there's mm. some more detail that we don't know about. But yeah, a great story. Brilliant. And also, if we do Phosphorus, we get to mention the wonderful Match Girls. Oh, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. And Fossy Jaw and Pissy Phosphorus. Yep. Pissy gold hunting. <laughs> <laughs> a splendid, splendid. Well, what do you think, people? What do you think of phosphorus, the fantastic poison? What do you think of the merry widow of Windy Nook? What do you think of her motives? What what made her flip? What made her flip suddenly well, yeah. in old age? Did she suddenly see an opportunity because because everyone was older? Yeah. She could do away with them more easily if you were a young man. Who knows? She never, never gave a hint yeah. of it. Uh, what do you think of the landlord? How did he know so much about <laughs> Ernest's pants? Or lack thereof. La- <laughs> <laughs> I know he's not wearing undershirts because I've got all of them. <laughs> what do you think of the Match Girls strike? A wonderful, wonderful piece of history, again, of people rising up to say, fuck you to people <laughs> who make you work in horrific conditions. Tell us what you think. Jump on the comments of this episode or wherever you listen on social media. Tell us your thoughts. Tell us your theories. More poisons you'd like us to do a special on. But most importantly, you should... You should. ...mix up a matchstick Sazerac. Absolutely. The, and the matchstick makes a difference. 
indeed it's really good so yeah the recipe will be out this evening it's a great one to try mm. and w- you will have all the bits in your cupboard nothing weird and unusual going on in there give it a go you need a match but the match makes a difference we should also mention that this week you didn't do an absinthe rinse you did an absinthe spritz oh a spritz a yes spritz. i've you gone for a spritz you bought a little tiny bottle yeah that does a spritzy spritzy well, it's very, very, and it's much better than trying to do an absinthe rinse which is like pouring stuff in and twirling your glass mm. and just going spray spray and also those bottles can double up as like a mouth spray thing. that's true with absinthe <laughs> As- <laughs> anatomizer <laughs> At- atomizer An- anatomizer anatomizer yeah so like a mouth spray but just with absinthe yeah. lovely <laughs> I'll be unconscious very soon. I've had two of those drinks and I'm feeling really drunk. Hooray! <laughs> Let's arrange your bookshelves. Next week is episode 150 before our break. So we're building up to a big one. If you have thoughts or comments about uh, particular big episodes that yeah, you want us to tell cover. Tell me what I should do because apparently it's <laughs> got to be a really, to... really big one. Okay, Nick forgets that we've discussed this. Oh, I forget many things. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll sit him down in his nice chair and talk him through it. Join us on Patreon if you haven't already. This weekend is our book chat about Akatar, and we're picking our new book as well. So if you're not a Patreon already, you want to be part of it, join before this weekend. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Boys!